Professor John Rogers from the University of Illinois Champaign. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about his background. He did his undergraduate in chemistry and physics at uh, UT Austin in uh, 1989. Then uh, did his graduate uh, studies at MIT. Received his PhD in physical chemistry in 1995. Then he held uh, several positions. He um, moved to Bell Labs as a member of the technical staff in uh, 1997. Became a director there from 2000 to 2002. And uh, he's currently the Lee J. Flory Founder Chair in Engineering at the Urbana-Champaign. John had a really uh, very productive and uh, impressive career. If you check his uh, statistics and the number of papers and citations on the web of science is really uh, extraordinary. He also uh, has received many awards, in including the MacArthur Fellowship Award in 2009, which is a very prestigious award, as well as the Lemelson MIT Prize in 2011. John is also uh, very entrepreneurial. He's uh, been involved in uh, many startups, and as you see, as you will see from his work, uh, he does very creative uh, work at the boundaries of uh, science and engineering. And so, without any further ado, John, please welcome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here, and I've really enjoyed my day. I was just blown away by all the things going on here and the facilities and everything else. So you guys are lucky to be in this place, uh, and I'm happy to be here also, uh, have a chance to spend the day with you. Uh, and I'll tell you at this point about uh, some work that we've been doing at uh, Illinois over the last, I would say, collectively five or six years, in which we're trying to develop materials and uh, mechanics and manufacturing techniques for classes of uh, electronic systems that are soft and stretchable, just like uh, the human body, uh, and thereby uh, opening up opportunities for real intimate integration of electronics with the body for potential beneficial uh, outcomes in uh, human health. And so what I'll try to do is I'll start with a uh, motivation and try to provide a perspective of what this kind of electronics is relative to conventional silicon wafer-based systems, as well as organic and flexible electronics, which is uh, such an emphasis uh, here. Uh, and then I'll step you through some approaches that have been useful for us in materials, uh, mechanics, designs, uh, and assembly techniques for manufacturing. And when you put those things together, then you have uh, an ability to really build system level devices that have useful functionality in a number of areas. I'll tell you about neural interfaces that we've developed to diagnose certain forms of epilepsy as well as what we're calling epidermal electronics that could be useful for health and wellness monitoring and uh, machine human uh, interfaces. So let me start by um, uh, just reviewing, you know, what one dominant future of electronics is. And uh, you guys are probably all familiar with this. This is really a development trend line that's characterized silicon wafer-based electronics from very early days of the industry up until the present time in which the number of transistors per processor chip is doubling about every 18 months. Of course, that's Moore's law. And so if you think about this, this is an interesting trend because it allows you to build more and more functionality per unit area because you have more and more switching elements and devices. And the other benefit is that by making transistors smaller and smaller, you can switch them at higher and higher speeds at lower and lower uh, voltages. And so if you think about a future in electronics, this is a dominant one, and it will remain uh, a dominant future of electronics because now uh, an enormous industry is built up uh, around this. And if you think about the uh, scientific problems uh, here, it's really all about making devices smaller. And uh, there are a number of materials, electrical engineering, manufacturing challenges there that will be required to, uh, to be addressed in order to maintain that kind of uh, growth curve. And so if you think about the problem statement, the problem statement really is you never have enough transistors are never small enough, uh, and then that drives, drives progress uh, forward. And that's certainly uh, a worthy and exciting area to do research, sort of the frontier of Moore's Law electronics. It's really not the uh, future that we're interested in, however, and I think a lot of the groups here are also thinking a little bit differently, in which you consider the problem statement being that all of these classes of electronics from the very early days are all tethered to a rigid, planar, brittle piece of silicon, uh, a semiconductor wafer platform. 
and that, that the mechanics and the geometries and the things that you can do with a silicon wafer really constrain uh, engineering opportunities. And so that kind of form of electronics can address a lots, lots of important problems, and it does, uh, but not all uh, problems. And so it was really partly for that reason that uh, you know, the world of flexible electronics uh, started to be interesting. And this is an area that uh, we worked in uh, for a long time uh, back at Bell Labs, extending a little bit to my time uh, at Illinois in terms of a technical and engineering contribution to the field. I think this represented for us uh, the high water mark. And so I had the good fortune of teaming up with a number of uh, talented folks at Bell Labs in the early days of this field. And this was the outcome of a joint development effort between E-Inc, which at that time was just a tiny little company in the Cambridge area, and a team of us at Bell Labs, uh, Lucent Technologies, in which we were uh, attempting to bring together their electrophoretic ink technology with our thin film organic transistor technology to build an electronic paper-like display. And I think this was the uh, very first uh, display of that type. And I think uh, this has the chance of being a real ubiquitous form of consumer electronics technology. It looks like things are headed in that direction. This is the uh, overall system that emerged from that collective effort. What you're really looking at here is just the electrophoretic ink. If you were able to see through it, then you would see in the back side of this thing, uh, this flexible sheet of electronics which is what we were focused on in this joint development effort. And this consists of an array of uh, pentacene-based thin film transistors with a small molecule polycrystalline film you can deposit by thermal evaporation onto a sheet of plastic. This is PET in this case. And they were using sort of soft lith lithographic sort of printing techniques to pattern the uh, critical uh, features of this, uh, of this system. And you put those two things together, you can make uh, a display of that type. And so I think that's interesting. A lot of other people uh, do as well. There are a number of companies uh, pursuing this. Uh, but, you know, if you think about it, this is great. It represents an advancement over, you know, more conventional, rigid, brittle types of electronics. Uh, but it doesn't really solve all the problems. So it solves this class of problem, and that's uh, useful and makes it worthy of study in itself. But if you think about the shortcomings of this type of system, the, the number one uh, issue is that the kind of uh, performance you can get out of the transistors is modest. It's good enough for this, some other kinds of applications. You want to do computing, it sort of falls short because the uh, charge transport mobilities in these materials is sort of comparable to morphous silicon, a few orders of magnitude worse than silicon itself, monocrystalline silicon, and another few orders of magnitude worse uh, than compound semiconductors like gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, indium arsenide, uh, those classes of materials. So if you could come back and address that shortcoming in this system, then you might open up new uh, application possibilities. So that's one challenge in electrical characteristics that you might think about. The other one is in mechanics. So this is a great type of mechanics. It's certainly nicer than the amorphous silicon on glass plate backplane electronics that exist today. You can, you know, fold it up and you can, you can roll it. But it's not the kind of mechanics that you ultimately might want. Uh, this is a bendable type of mechanics. Uh, what you might want if you want to integrate with the human body is something that's more elastic, more like a rubber band. So you can bend, but you can also stretch. So able to accommodate large strain deformations and, just, and not just bending type uh, deformations. So that really became a focus. Those two aspects uh, of what we wanted to do when uh, I started up at Illinois as a way to sort of extend along this kind of uh, research direction, but to try to you know, move, move it forward uh, a little bit. And the reason why we're interested uh, in that I had to do with some application opportunities that uh, could emerge from a successful effort on those two goals, uh, eliminate the uh, uh, electronic constraints of uh, organic semiconductors and move beyond flexible to stretchable. And as I've mentioned now a couple of times, one uh, dominant area that we think could be powerful is if you could build electronics that look like the human body in shape and mechanics. So mechanically matched to the tissue, shape conformal with it. So you can imagine making high performance electronics that either integrate on an external organ like the skin or an internal organ system like the brain uh, or the heart. And I'll step you through ideas that allow you to do exactly that and exactly that uh, and with, with high performance and useful levels of functionality. The other thing that we've been uh, pursuing over the years is this notion of bio-inspired device design. So if you think about evolution, uh, that process has yielded lots of solutions to very difficult challenges in technology. And none of those solutions have the geometry or mechanics of a silicon wafer. And in particular, if you think about the mammalian eye, it represents a curvilinear uh, CCD 
detector surface, essentially. And that's much different than the planar CCDs that are available commercially today. And that kind of curvilinear geometry can be powerful because you can design the curvature such that it matches the image surface that forms with a simple uh, lens element to allow very wide angle field of view, very low levels of aberration, and very uniform illumination levels, uh, even with extremely simple optics. And so uh, biologically inspired cameras is a, another area where we've been uh, quite active. I won't tell you anything about that uh, effort, just these two things, but just mention that you know, the kind of electronics I'll describe uh, in the next few moments uh, enable bio-inspired device design uh, as well. So if you think about these devices, I mean, I think one strategy would be to, uh, you know, extend the kind of uh, performance that's available in known organic semiconductors and uh, to, uh, you know, eliminate these uh, property constraints in that way. I think that's a great direction for research. Um, I think when I went to Illinois, I decided that's a little bit too crowded. We need to do a little bit something different. It's difficult to compete with guys like, you know, uh, Bernard and and Seth and the other folks that are here. So instead, we uh, decided to go back and revisit silicon a little bit and uh, see if we could figure out how to adapt its use for these kinds of uh, systems with the idea that if you could do that, then you could build on uh, a really powerful knowledge and engineering base uh, that has emerged from the conventional silicon wafer-based electronics industry over the last 40, 50 years. And so if you think about uh, silicon uh, wafer, it has its mechanical, mechanical uh, attributes partly because of the intrinsic properties of the silicon, but also because of the geometry of the structure. So the wafer itself is about a millimeter thick. And if you think about the bending stiffness of a material, it depends not only on the Young's modulus of the material itself, but also the thickness. And in particular, the bending stiffness, EI here, uh, is linearly proportional to the Young's modulus. It depends on the cube of the thickness. And the consequence of that is pretty simple, but it's also profound if you think about the magnitude. So consider the uh, silicon wafer geometry is maybe a millimeter thick. The bending stiffness in that case uh, with 150 gigapascals for the Young's modulus is about 10 Newton meters. That's very, very stiff. If you take that silicon wafer and you have a way to shave it thin all the way down into sort of a nanoscale membrane, so maybe 10 or 100 nanometers in thickness, the bending stiffness can be reduced by 15 orders of magnitude because of that cubic dependence. You go from 10 newton meters to 10 femtonewton meters just by reducing the thickness. And that's not a quantum effect, but it still has a qualitative impact on the way that you think about the mechanics of the material. So here's an example of a 20 nanometer thick monocrystal and semiconductor grade sheet of silicon, nanomembrane of silicon. You can see it is quite floppy because of that uh, very, very, very low bending stiffness. The other consequence of thin is that for a given bend radius, the peak strains induced in the material are reducing linearly with thickness. And so as a result of making this thing thin, you can bend it to a very sharp radius of curvature without fracturing the silicon, which t tends to fracture around a half or 1% uh, tensile strain. So it's floppy, very low bending snip. It's, it's very bendable because of that linear dependence of the peak strains, uh, uh, bending induced uh, strains on thickness. So the other consequence of mechanics in silicon nanomembers is a little bit less obvious, but it's uh, equally important when you think about building the systems that I'll uh, talk to you about in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And that has to do with interface uh, fracture mechanics. So if you take silicon in this very, very thin form, here's an example of a platelet of silicon printed onto a silicon substrate in which we've structured the uh, surface to create this ridge. You actually print this uh, membrane or this cantilevered structure down on top of the wafer. Even without any adhesive at all, you can keep it in that suspended state because in this very small geometry, surface forces can be uh, dominating uh, in terms of uh, uh, interface uh, interactions. The other aspect uh, that allows this to happen is uh, has to do with the propensity for cracks to form between that interface that forms due to van der Waals interactions. So if you look at basic fracture mechanics, you can derive expressions like this. So this corresponds to fracture induced by a difference in thermal expansion coefficient of this silicon plate and the underlying substrate, which could be a sheet of plastic. And so those two materials have much different CTEs. And so if you heat them up, interface stresses will tend to drive a crack at that interface, but the energy release rate is actually linearly proportional to the thickness of the plate that's sitting on the substrate. And so as a result of that, as you go to this silicon nanomembrane regime, the interface uh, energy release rates uh, decrease uh, substantially such that it's much easier to get sheets of uh, silicon to stick to a substrate than it is chips of silicon. 
And so as a result of that linear decrease in the energy release rate, these nanomembranes are, fu are functionally sticky to almost any surface you want to uh, integrate the silicon onto. So you can easily get it to bond to plastic or rubber, whereas getting a silicon chip to do that is very difficult because of that uh, linear scaling of the energy release rate with thickness. So that's why we li like uh, nanomembranes as building blocks as sort of favorable mechanics associated with this thin geometry. How do you create materials like that uh, in the first place? So there's a variety of ways to do it. You can do it by uh, anisotropically etching silicon wafers that have 111 orientation. You can also do it with compound semiconductors. I'll show you that second example in the next couple of slides because uh, materials like gallium arsenide are interesting if you want to do high performance solar cell, you want to do a laser or an LED, or you want to do RF electronics. And so in this case, we use uh, very advanced forms of epitaxial liftoff. And so in this case, we start with a gallium arsenide wafer, and then we do MOCVD epitaxial growth of our alternating layers of high aluminum content gallium aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide itself. And you can grow purely epitaxially, very thick multi-layer structures like that, which are interesting because if you etch down through that stack to expose the sidewalls and you dunk it in HF, HF will etch away the aluminum arsenide at a rate that's about a factor of a million times faster than it will etch gallium arsenide. And so the consequence of that is you lift off this underlying growth substrate, multi-layer stacks of gallium arsenide nanomembranes. Again, semiconductor grade monocrystalline materials that are interesting as building blocks because of the mechanics I talked about in the previous slide. And then, oh, by the way, you don't consume the wafer, uh, and so you can come back uh, and you can do this growth again. So it's a way to really adapt existing thin film growth techniques to allow you to create bulk quantities of uh, high quality semiconductor material in a cost effective way. So that's the scheme, uh, and that's the idea. It's multi layer epitaxial liftoff. You can actually do that pretty effectively. So this is an example of a 40 layer stack of 200 nanometer thick layers of gallium arsenide separated by 20 nanometer thick layers of aluminum arsenide. Again, etched down through the stack, expose the sidewall, dunk it in HF, and off comes uh, bulk quantities of uh, gallium arsenide nanomembranes. You can do that with gallium arsenide in its uh, pure form. You can also dope it. Uh, to create multi-layer stacks. It can be used as functional elements for solar cells and infrared detectors, or you know, just pure gallium arsenide is useful for RF transistors such as MESFETs, all separated by these uh, layers of aluminum arsenide. So you lift off uh, material, you reuse the wafer, uh, and you can do things that way. So this is what it looks like if you do that etching process, vertically etch down to define the lateral dimensions of the nanomembranes, release everything with the HF etch, and in this case, all the material comes off into the etching bath, and then you deposit it back down onto a sheet of fil filter paper, and this is what it looks like. In this case, it's sort of bulk quantity of single junction gallium arsenide microscale solar cells. It's about 200 microns on the side. It's about one to two microns in thickness, depending on the design. Uh, and this is the kind of material you get out. So this is an idea in materials that I think is compatible with those ideas in mechanics. The next question is, what do you do with it? I mean, this is a material, this is not a solar module. So how do you get these materials to go down into well-defined engineering locations on a uh, substrate of interest so you can interconnect it and make a system? And one way to do that might be to make a solution slurry of this stuff, which is what naturally forms if you allow the material to come off the surface of the wafer, and then deposit that down with an inkjet printer onto a substrate that has strategic features of relief on its surface or patterns of chemical functionalization to guide the self-assembly of those elements onto the surface as they sediment out of that solution suspension. And I think that's an interesting conceptual way to think about it. We've worked on that problem. Uh, over the years, a number of other groups as well. I think at the end of the day, in order to achieve the kind of yields you need in order to uh, build uh, devices that have interesting levels of integration, it's going to be hard to do that because the yield requirements and the positional accuracy requirements are very, very challenging. So I think it's a still a good topic to work on, but in the meantime, just to uh, allow ourselves to move beyond that stage into a point where we can build real devices, we've taking a little bit different approach. It's a lot more deterministic in the assembly, uh, but still allowing uh, these nanomembranes to be exploited um, in the ways that I've, I've suggested previously. And so in this scheme, we're using ideas adapted from the world of soft lithography, where instead of printing molecules, we print solid inks, the inks being the nanomembranes themselves. And we do that in a way that exploits the known positions of these elements uh, 
on the wafer uh, because we're defining them lithographically. So we create them in a way that doesn't simply allow them to float off of the wafer after they're completely undercut etched. Instead, they're tethered to the mother wafer at strategic locations such that you can come in with a soft elastomeric stamp, contact those undercut etched nanomembranes. The Interwell's forcers can be sufficiently strong that when you peel the stamp back, you pop the anchors, thereby inking up the stamp with those nanomembranes. Then uh, in a second step, you move the ink stamp over to a target surface, sheet of plastic, piece of rubber, uh, and then you print those membranes down. You can come back and in step and repeat fashion, you can take a dense collection of silicon or gallium arsenide nanomembranes and spread them out uh, in a desired layout over large areas uh, on, uh, on a piece of plastic, for example, uh, at room temperature, which is you know, compatible with the low, low temperature characteristics of, of the plastic. Uh, and so then the next step would be to interconnect those elements to make a, a functional device. So this is the uh, cartoon illustration of the process. I mean, in order to make this work, it really requires a careful um, uh, attention to be paid to the uh, physics of soft adhesion between this elastomeric stamp and the undercut etched uh, silicon nanomembranes. And in particular, what you need is the adhesion to be strong enough between those nanomembranes and the stamp so that when you peel the stamp back, you can fracture the anchors so you can efficiently ink up the stamp with that, uh, with that material. But you don't want it to be too strong because you need to get the nanomembranes off of the stamp down onto the target surface, also at high yields. And so what you really need is a mechanism for switching the strength of adhesion between those nanomembranes and the stamp from a strong state for the inking part of the process to a weak state for the printing part of the process. And we've spent a number of years working on that problem. It really has to do, again, with the physics of soft adhesion. And I won't step you through the different strategies. One way is to exploit the viscoelastic na nature of the elastomer. And it turns out that because of the viscoelasticity, the interface uh, adhesion can be strong at high peel rates and by comparison low uh, at low peel rates. So you can peel quickly to ink, you peel slowly to print. That would be one example. There are other ways to add texture and relief onto the stamp surface using principles of gecko adhesive so that you can control with pressure the contact areas allowing you again to go from strong to weak uh, adhesion. So I won't go through, through those details uh, in this talk, but just make the point that that can work at high yields. You can build uh, a prototype you know, manufacturing tool around those principles. In this case, uh, it's just an, a fully automated system. The stamp is down here. We have load cells here. The stamp is transparent, so you can do overlay registration with a vision system that involves looking through the stamp. There's a donor wafer. This is a Gen 3 uh, glass uh, substrate chuck. Uh, there's an X stage, Y stage there, and then a Z stage over here. So the stamp can move back and forth and do that kind of printing process uh, in an automated uh, way. Uh, and then, you know, if you do that, you can create objects that look like this. So this is a sheet of plastic, a PET. It has on its surface uh, a square array of square gallium arsenide nanomembranes, about 250 microns on the side, about 200 nanometers thick. It's about 1,600 of them. In this particular case, is 100% uh, yield. Starting from a dense array of these things, undercut at, strategically anchored on a mother substrate, uh, and then uh, assembled in this step and repeat fashion to create a sparse aerial coverage on this sheet of plastic. So that was done on a flat sheet uh, geometry and then subsequently just wrapped it around this cylindrical glass support to just show the mechanical flexibility here, which is deriving from two things in this case, the thin geometry of the gallium arsenide nanomembranes and the thin uh, small thickness of the underlying plastic substrate. That favorable uh, adhesion mechanics, which results from the thin geometry of the gallium arsenide, allows these things to stick and stay adhered even when, uh, even when bent. So those are the concepts. And what uh, I'll do now is sort of fast forward and make the argument that if you have a high quality semiconductor material like this on plastic, you can go through and you can process that material to interconnect uh, the resulting devices to make uh, high performance uh, systems that have, have the kind of mechanics that we were interested in. And this is just an example of that. We're interested in seeing how far we could go. This uh, involved, is this a piece of CMOS silicon uh, circuitry, very simple device, just inverters, printed onto a very, very thin sheet of poly image. So we're just pushing the thickness down as far as we thought we could go comfortably, a little bit over 1.5 microns in total thickness. And as a result of the thin overall thickness, the thin geometry of the silicon uh, nanomembranes shown here in a cross-sectional 
schematic illustration, you can bend this thing to uh, incredibly small bend radii, in this case about 25 microns corresponding to the sharp edge of that cover slip. So just making everything thin makes it bendable. You can be a little bit smarter than that though. You can actually choose the thickness of the polyimide substrate such that the neutral mechanical plane is coincident with the silicon, which happens to be the most brittle material in this simple integrated circuit. And you can think of the uh, neutral mechanical plane as a very simple thing. If you have a sheet of plastic, if you bend it like this, then the top surface is in tension, the bottom surface is in compression. The geometrical midpoint corresponds to the point through that cross section where there's zero bend, bending induced uh, strain. That's the neutral mechanical plane. It's the geometric midpoint in a uniform sheet of material. It's a little bit more complicated here because you have different materials with different mechanical properties, but you can compute where it is and choose the thickness of the polyimide. Uh, again, such that you get that neutral mechanical plane overlap with the silicon. So if you do all those things, you make it very bendable, uh, and then at the same time you have individual device characteristics that at least in our hands are similar to otherwise uh, similar designs that you would build on an SOI wafer substrate, but with this kind of mechanics. So mobility in the range of 400, on off 10 to 5th, that, that could be a little bit better, but that's, that's what we get. Uh, and then without trying too hard, even uh, pushing the channel dimensions down very far, you can uh, you know, achieve a good fraction of a gigahertz in uh, F tau. And so, you know, RF uh, applications become possible. So that's the story on bendable, and that's pretty easy, very simple uh, ideas and mechanics. Uh, that's not what you need, though, as I've mentioned a couple of times, for biointegration. So you can take a sheet like this and you can wrap a cylinder or a cone, but you can't wrap a sphere, you certainly can't wrap a body part. And moreover, this kind of bending mechanics doesn't accommodate the natural motions of biological systems which involve stretching and compressing and swelling and moving in more complex ways. So the question is how do you go from flexible to something more like a sheet of latex uh, which, is, uh, which is stretchable uh, like, like a rubber band. And you might think that that's uh, pretty difficult because silicon itself can only tolerate a strain of maybe a half a percent. But even that turns out to be uh, really pretty easy. So if you take silicon strips, uh, and we s just stumbled on this by accident, but you know, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So you take these very thin uh, silicon membranes, come into strips, and then if you bond those to a pre-strained uh, rubber substrate, and then you relax that pre-strain, what happens in c is compressive stresses act on those silicon strips, and the result is a nonlinear buckling instability that creates a wavy geometry in the silicon, which is uniformly bonded to the underlying silicone uh, elastomer. And so you can imagine now, if you have this thing, you can stretch this composite structure now back and forth in a way that achieves an effective end-to-end -end deformation, large strain deformation, without inducing any substantial strains in the silicon itself, because out-of-plane deformations can accommodate in plane uh, strains. And in particular, if you take this thing, you stretch it, the amplitude goes down, the wavelength goes up. Likewise, if you compress this thing down, the amplitude goes up, the wavelength goes down. So it's really nothing more than an accordion built out of silicon nanomembranes integrated with a very soft elastomer substrate. So it turns out the mechanics is not quite this simple, and mechanics is absolutely critical in terms of understanding how to engineer these things. And I won't go through the details. We work very closely with a theoretical mechanician at Northwestern to understand exactly where the stresses and strains are in this type of you know, composite structure, which is interesting because this is 150 gigapascals in modulus, and this is only one and a half megapascals. So enormous difference in mechanical properties. You didn't really understand what's going on there and engineer it uh, in a useful way. Now spe speaking of useful, this is not useful. I mean, this is a test structure to allow you to study the mechanics and demonstrate the principles. But the nice thing about that buckling physics is you can apply it chip scale to the same kind of neutral mechanical plane designs, ultra thin systems that I showed you before. So if you take now a rubber substrate and you biaxially pre-strain it, take your ultra thin silicon CMOS neutral mechanical plane optimized bond it in that biaxially uh, pre-strain form, then let that go, you get a much more complex uh, buckling deformation, but nevertheless it just creates this out of plane deformation that allows you to accommodate in plane strains. And so this is an example of the result of that process is simple uh, inverter circuit. This is a, a, a PMOS device, NMOS device, so it's a CMOS silicon system. Uh, this is polyimide here. These are the uh, interconnects. And you can see the uh, full 3D finite element modeling sort of captures the key aspects of this, one of which is that most of the buckling happens at the locations of the interconnect lines because the uh, flexural rigidity here and here is much lower than it is here because there's no silicon uh, here. So it really moves the buckling away from the rigid 
parts of the system into the uh, interconnects essentially. This is a short movie showing that process happening in real time. So by actually pre-stained rubber substrate allow it to relax and you see these buckled uh, features begin to develop uh, in the uh, interconnects. That's at the uh, example of just a simple logic gate, but that's sort of a packaging step that you can apply to an arbitrarily complex circuit over l much larger areas. So this is an example of 10 CMOS ring oscillators, three stage, they're individual uh, in-channel and P-channel devices here and then inverters over here. So this is actually an image taken with uh, grazing uh, angle illumination to really highlight the out of plane deformation associated with the buckling. The actual magnitude of the buckling is pretty modest. It's only a few microns in Z amplitude and a few hundred microns in wavelength. So it's, it's modest, but it's enough to provide that kind of strain relief. If you take this thing and you stretch it this way or this way or that way, the uh, pattern of buckling will change to accommodate that strain in a way that avoids fracture inducing strains in any of the active uh, materials. So if you think about that uh, device, it looks uh, you know, sort of awful. You take the nice planar device and you sort of crumple it up uh, like a sheet of paper or something like that, but it's not crumpled in a very extreme way. And in fact, you can probe the individual devices and you can see that they can uh, perform quite nicely and that the circuit uh, overall has, uh, uh, retains its function even when in, in this kind of buckled uh, geometry. So that's one way to do things, and it's not a very smart way. You're really at the mercy of buckling mechanics. You just take your circuit, slap it on, and whatever happens when you relax the pre-strain is what happens. Uh, and it can work at some level. There are two main disadvantages, however. One is that the overall range of stretchability is modest. It's about 15 to 20 percent. So maybe a factor of 10 or 20 larger than the silicon itself it's still not like a rubber band. And there are regions of the body that undergo larger deformation. So you need to think about that limitation. The other one is that the entire circuit uh, is under uh, seeing stresses and strains. Uh, they're much smaller than they otherwise would be, but these buckled regions, the silicon is actually uh, seeing a finite strain. And as a result of that, uh, because the strain couples to the mobility, if you stretch the circuit this way or that way or that way, the output currents and the mobilities of the transistors fluctuate up and down by maybe 20%, 10-20%. And so that may or may not be a problem. It's a complex circuit that may have an effect on the overall function of the system. If it's not complex, maybe you can kind of live with it. But if you think about trying to engineer this system, retain the basic ideas I talked to you uh, about previously, then uh, there are ways around those two uh, limitations. And in fact, if you take one of those circuits and just do two simple things, one is cut holes in it, so you structure it into an open mesh geometry, that's number one. And then number two, instead of using interface chemistry to bond the circuit everywhere to the underlying substrate, use pattern chemistry to do things in a little bit more intelligent way so you can control where the buckling happens. If you do those two things, uh, and you know, there are a lot of different elaborations on those kind of ideas, but if you do those two things, you can eliminate those two advantages. You make things that really stretch like a rubber band up to 200% strain is not a problem. And you can very effectively strain isolate uh, the active components in the system. And this is a very simple illustration of those ideas. So this is a mesh array of platelets of silicon interconnected by these narrow uh, ribbon cables. Uh, in which we've selectively bonded only the nodes of this mesh, mesh to the underlying uh, rubber substrate. And as a result, after you relax the biaxial pre-strain, these regions, which are not bonded, actually delaminate and buckle up out of the plane to create these kind of arc-shaped, non-coplanar interconnects, which uh, contain metallizations. This is polymer and metallization in a neutral mechanical plane layout, polymer, metal, polymer, uh, polymer. Uh, and these are just silicon platelets to illustrate the concept. So if you're in this regime, you can stretch 150, 200% any direction you want, and the strains of the silicon are very, very small, almost independent uh, of the level of deformation. And what that allows you to do, not only stretch and strain like a, a rubber band, but also wrap essentially arbitrarily curved surface. So not only a sphere, but also, let's say, the dimpled surface of a golf ball. And this was just a, a demo that we published uh, a couple, couple years ago. And it turns out that there are a lot of people interested in smart golf balls. So that itself may be an application, but it's not one we're interested in. We're just uh, demonstrating a capability uh, there. Um, but what do you do with it? And uh, I mentioned uh, at the outset, what we want to do is take that kind of technology and really allow an integration of electronics with the human body that has been previously impossible. 
And so if you think about electronics interface to the body, that also has a large, long history, just like silicon electronics. And uh, it's useful to be mindful of what's been done in the past. And this uh, view graph has tried to illustrate, you know, some of the things that are already out there, FDA approved and in widespread use. Many of them are passive, some of them are uh, electronic uh, at some simple level. Pacemaker, for example, cochlear implant, a little bit more sophisticated. Brain stimulator uh, is an interesting one. So this is a device uh, sold by Medtronics to uh, treat certain forms of Parkinson's disease. Here's what the device looks like. And it's useful to think about the construct because it's common to all the devices that are available right now. It's basically a package of electronics. Take a silicon wafer-based electronics, put it in a box, seal it up. Uh, and then that provides the smarts for uh, an electrical interface to the tissue. It's actually very primitive. It's basically just wire electrodes. In this case, just a few uh, contact electrodes that penetrate down into the deep brain. Uh, and so the interface is primitive and you've really separated the electronics from the tissue. I mean, electronics is over here. You just have electrodes really interfacing to the tissue. And that has a strong limitation in the kinds of things you can think about doing. And the reason why it's done this way is silicon wafer doesn't interface well with the brain. I'll come back to that in a second. The other uh, point of integration that's worth thinking about, and I'll come back to this as well, is through the skin. Same type of interface. Basically point contact electrodes either penetrating the stratum corneum or uh, interface with a conductive gel. And then those wires run out to a separate box of electronics that either does a stimulation or data acquisition. So those kinds of technologies can be useful, but we think they fall short of uh, what you ultimately want to uh, do. And you can think about uh, you know, what you might want to do, maybe most clearly in the context of the brain, because the brain itself is a piece of electronics, biological electronics. And so if you want to deliver therapy to the brain, you want to understand the function of the brain, you would probably want to bring to bear on that problem the most sophisticated man-made form of electronics. And of course, that's silicon CMOS. But the geometry is totally mismatched, and so is the mechanics. So again, think about the mechanics of silicon. It's 150 gigapascal. The mechanics of the brain, uh, the module is about five kilopascal. So it's like enormous mismatch in shape and ge uh, geometry and mechanics as well. And so what do people do? They use devices uh, like this. So this is Utah Array. It's been used for the last 15, 20 years. Absolute workhorse for studying uh, neuroscience. Very powerful piece of technology. The way that it works is it's a flat platform. You can dice out a silicon chip, glue it up here. And then the interface consists of an array of sharp silicon shards that plunge into the soft tissue of the brain, uh, mounted up with an air hammer, typically. And the way that that works then is it accommodates the shape mismatch because these different pins can penetrate to different depths uh, in the brain. And that's great. So you can establish an interface that way. And it is a valuable piece of technology historically and likely going forward as well. But we think the future uh, might be a little bit different because that penetrating process damages the tissue. And then furthermore, because these shards of material have a much higher modulus than the brain tissue, and the brain is actually rattling around in the skull over time. It's swelling, it's contracting, it's a dynamic system. It causes a continued irritation between those spikes and the tissue that degrades the interface over time. And so for those two reasons, it's difficult to uh, see this becoming uh, widespread and uh, use for humans, but uh, you know, it is useful for research. So what is the future? The future, we think, is to make this kind of electronics look like the tissue. So, mechanically matched to it, same kind of modulus, shape conformal, uh, and then built with biocompatible materials. So you really have uh, a, an intimate form of integration, uh, bringing that abiotic system into communication with the biotic one to do uh, various things. So what would you want to do if you have electronics on the brain? Um, what do you want to be, be able to do with that? Certainly, it could be a powerful tool for studying neuroscience. We're interested in that but we're more interested in things that can have an impact in clinical medicine. And so for that reason, we work with clinicians who uh, uh, perform the following uh, surgical operation to treat certain acute forms of epilepsy. So certain epileptics are simply uh, non-responsive to drug treatments. And in that case, the, the, uh, the therapy is a surgical one that involves a few steps. The first step is you cut open the uh, skull to expose the brain and the patient is under a local anesthetic during this whole process, so they're awake, they know what's going on, but I'm told that there are no nerve endings on the surface of the brain, so this is not quite as bad as it looks. But now that when you, once you have the brain open, you laminate on the surface of the brain these bulk electrodes. So no electronics here, it was just sort of bulk uh, electrode pads, each one of which connects to a wire that comes out to an external data acquisition system. Could be in the form of a strip, 
or a skull cap like this. So maybe 20 electrodes or so across the whole array. And then what's done is a drug is administered to artificially uh, stimulate a seizure. And so, uh, while that's happening, patient is awake and you're recording the electrical uh, responses, temporal responses at each of those uh, point contacts as the seizure is going on. And at that point, a trained surgeon, like the ones that we work with, are able to look at that pattern of activity and identify from that the region of the brain that's most closely responsible for the seizure itself, at which point this thing is peeled back uh, and then you go in with a scalpel and basically cut out that part of the brain. So if you think about that process, it seems sort of crude, but that's what's available, that's what's done today. If you want to make it a lot more sophisticated, you would use electronics, not just electrodes to allow you know, orders of magnitude better spatial resolution and time resolution and that kind of mapping uh, procedure. And that's what we've focused on, the groups that we work at the Penn Epilepsy Center at the University of Pennsylvania's Medical School. So the devices that we uh, have devised for that purpose look a little bit like this. So it's all the technologies and the approaches that I was showing you before just integrated into uh, a system level device that in this case corresponds to a little over 2,000 of these silicon nanomembrane transistors in an array format uh, consisting, in this case it's actually a cardiac device. The neural one has uh, about 600 sensors, so a little bit more transistors than this. The layout's very similar. So six, 288 in this case. Each unit cell consists of electrode pad, uh, a silicon MOSFET as a multiplexer and then a local amplifier here because the signals are very low in a very thin flexible sheet. So it's basically like an electronic saran wrap uh, goes on the brain or you know for this particular device uh, the heart. One of the things you have to worry about not only the mechanics and the electrical properties but these things have to be fu fully waterproof because when you open up the skull the brain starts drying out. So you've got to flush it with warm saline solution occasionally and in many cases your device is going to be right there. So it's totally immersed in biofluids and saline and so as a result it has to operate uh, without any substantial leakage currents for you know, a few hours uh, when immersed in saline solution. And that turns out to be a difficult problem uh, but one that can be solved. So you can use very thin water barrier layers so you don't destroy the mechanics but you uh, allow uh, operation in salt water. Uh, and so this slide is just to make the point that you have to worry about that uh, as well. So here's what the experiment looks like. It turns out that they have a colony of epileptic cats at the Penn Epilepsy Center. And so you can go through the surgical procedure I just described to you. So you open up the skull, expose the brain. In this case, we're laminating electronics, not electrodes, on the surface of the brain. Get a nice interface there. Because we have multiplexing capability, we can address hundreds of electrode uh, uh, pads with just you know, a small fraction of that number uh, of wires uh, coming out. And then the local amplification is important too because the signal levels are in the microvolt range and, you know, sub-millisecond time scales associated with the variation. So let me show you a movie of what uh, it looks like then uh, when you do all of that. So this is a color-coded uh, representation of the spatiotemporal variation in uh, potential measured on the surface of the brain uh, as that seizure is happening. So get it going here. So this is a representation. This is distance along one axis of that tape, the other axis. This is a time trace of a representative pixel in this array. So the drug is administered here. You begin to see a lot of abnormal electrical activity, but the seizure hasn't kicked in. The, the cat is not undergoing a physical seizure yet. That doesn't happen until a little over one second after the drug uh, is administered. So this is time in seconds, one, two, three, is dramatically slowed down compared to real time. So once the seizure happens, you begin to see very, very periodic variation in potential, potential in this direction, time in this direction for this one pixel. And you can see that very periodic response clearly here. And that is reflected in this kind of spiral wave, recurring spiral wave instability that you see in the spatio-temporal map. Uh, recorded from this device. So this is unmatched resolution in time and space for this kind of phenomena and it hasn't been observed in mammals before. It's been observed ex situ with brain slices. You slice them flat and you can put that on a silicon chip. And so you talk to the surgeon, they can tell from this kind of pattern which part of the brain needs to be res resected just from their experience. But there's a lot of unknown neuroscience associated with this process. So I think it's a useful diagnostic tool for the surgical procedure but also uh, could have the potential to provide new insights into what's really going on uh, in, in epilepsy. So this is one example of uh, 
uh, an outcome of some of these uh, ideas that I've uh, described to you. The other thing that you can do uh, is you can use this thing uh, as a discovery tool, essentially probe hidden regions of the brain that are completely inaccessible uh, any other way. So these things are flexible and floppy enough, you can wrap them around a soft insert and then you can plunge that down in the gap between the right and left hemisphere of the brain, for example, this cat model again, or even into the sol side. And then you can do high resolution mapping of both sides uh, of the brain and those hidden uh, surfaces uh, simultaneously. So this is some of the work that's ongoing with the, uh, with the pin group to try to exploit this stuff in different ways. So let me take the uh, next 10 minutes to talk to you about uh, a different point of integration. So I mentioned at the very outset, skin and brain. I told you about brain, let me tell you about skin. So skin is interesting for a lot of reasons. One is it allows you to potentially develop a technology that has uh, applications outside of the clinic, outside of the surgery uh, room, maybe a broader distribution. But just from a scientific standpoint, it's actually more challenging than brain or the heart where we've done a lot of work because it's time dynamic, one thing. So you have cell differentiation happening from base layers of the epidermis up to the stratum corneum and then the cells uh, exfoliate. So that uh, time variation is something that's difficult to deal with. The other thing is the surface of the skin is rough. It's relatively hard. Uh, and it also has a very low modulus. So it's, it has a topography, a modulus, and a time dynamic nature to it uh, that makes it challenging. But if you think about you know, integrating electronics on the skin, on the surface of that kind of tissue, then you might be able to do some uh, interesting things. So uh, as with the brain, it's useful to think about uh, what is the point of reference, like what, what is out there today and what are the shortcomings. So if you've been to the hospital, you've seen electrodes like this, conductive gels, uh, stick on pads, individual point contact electrodes, bulk wires coming to uh, a separate uh, brick of electronics you strap on or you'll put on your bedside. And this is fine probably for the clinic, certain research environments, but nobody wants to wear these because it's uncomfortable. It's like the uh, Chinese water torture or something like that. I mean, it's not painful, but it's like irritating you. It's driving you crazy after you wear these things for a while. The other thing is you really can't do massive numbers of electrodes. You imagine, you know, maybe you want to do a thousand, you know, measurement points across the chest. This does not scale because you just can't deal with all the wires. So one way to get a little bit more sophisticated is crack that box open, pull out the chips, glue them to a tape, and then tape that onto the skin. But as I've mentioned a few times before, the, uh, a sheet of plastic does not have the mechanics of tissue. It doesn't have the mechanics of skin because it can't follow the natural deformations of the skin because the tape is only flexible, it's not stretchable. So this is not really a great solution uh, either, although you know, it does, does have value. So you know, if you think about the challenges in skin-mounted uh, electronic devices, really mostly about interface and adhesion. You know, how do you get long-term viability? You need good access. But how do you get robust binding without uh, irritation? Uh, and you, know, you want it to be shape and conformal and have minimal cost, power, uh, weight, and size. So we've been thinking about that for a while. And over the last three years, I've been trying to build a system that would look like a kid's temporary transfer tattoo. Because in my view, that is one of the nicest types of technologies put on your skin because you don't even know it's there after it goes on. And it sticks, it's robust. And uh, you know, if you could make electronics in that form, maybe that would be kind of interesting. So what would it be then? You'd have to make it very, very thin. So let's say maybe five microns, maybe 20, something in that range. Uh, it needs to be very light in an aerial mass loading sense, so maybe a milligram per centimeter squared. It needs to be very low in modulus, as close to the epidermis as you can get. And if you can go even lower, it's even better. I'll come back to that in a second. So five kilopascals might be a good target. It also, however, needs to be air and water permeable to allow transpiration and sweat out of the skin, but at the same time, the electronics have to be uh, isolated from the skin. So uh, you have to have waterproof encapsulation on the electronics. So that's something that we've been working on, like I said, for three years or so. We had a first paper uh, over, the, uh, over the summer uh, in August. And so let me uh, show you how that works. But before I do that, let me get into a little bit more about the mechanics of interfaces uh, in this kind of system. So think about uh, a piece of electronics on uh, skin. And you can actually do an analytical uh, treatment of the interface stresses that form uh, between the electronics at the and the skin if you bend the skin or you stretch it. And it's really those interface stresses that tend to drive delamination and cause this um, challenge in binding robustness. So you can think about two types of stresses, shear stresses uh, or peeling stresses, both of which can cause delamination. You can just run calculations. So let's assume the skin has these properties, five kilopascal, one millimeter thick, and you have electronics with some modulus and some thickness. 
And so you can just calculate what kind of stresses do you have for a silicon chip, a sheet of flexible electronics, and then a skin-like electronics. So for silicon, 100 gig gigapascal, 300 microns in thickness. Plastic, 50 microns in thickness, 5 gigapascal might be a decent number. Polyamide, for example. Skin, 5 microns thick and 5 kilopascal. And then think about what, what the stresses are. So first of all, you see that the stresses peak up at the edges, and that's not surprising. So this is a normalized distance along the piece of electronics. That's the edge right there. So the stresses are peaked there, both for peeling stresses and shear stresses. But what's interesting is the magnitude. So consider the peak stress in these three cases. So consider the stress ratios for the silicon chip to the plastic sheet. So the question is, how much better do things go, get when I go from a silicon chip to a piece of flexible electronics? And the answer is better, but not that much better. So if you look at skin and tension or bending for shear and peeling stresses, you reduce them by maybe a factor of five. So that's good, but that's not really qualitatively changing the game. Now consider, though, the case of silicon chip compared to electronic skin. In that case, you really buy yourself maybe five orders of magnitude, four or five orders of magnitude. And that really, I think, goes a long way in solving the interface adhesion problem without going to uh, you know, invasive and uh, you know, irritating uh, adhesives. You really solve it by uh, reformulating the mechanics of the electronics to minimize those uh, interface uh, stresses. And so you can see that really simple. So if you take a sheet of a rubber um, uh, silicone uh, uh, sheet and you laminate it on the skin, you can take that same chemistry and you can formulate it different thicknesses and with different uh, modulus values and you can see the mechanics pretty clearly. So this is laminated on the wrist region. This is a relatively stiff, relatively thick sheet of rubber. Not that stiff, it's maybe two, three uh, megapascals, about a millimeter thick. That's not good enough. So you stretch the skin, you drive delamination at the interface. There's no adhesive here, so it's just Van der Waals adhesion, but it's not good enough because the interface stresses are too big. On the other hand, you take the same material, make it thinner, make it softer, uh, it stays adhered, just Van der Waals adhesion, because of the mechanics I just described to you. So you can stretch it, you can uh, bend it and wrinkle it, uh, and it stays, uh, it stays well uh, adhered. And so that's what we wanted to do uh, with electronics. There's some theory and measurements to quantify those effects. I'll skip through that. So, you know, how do you do that? And the answer is you basically take the kinds of ideas in very, very thin uh, active materials and buckling physics uh, to an extreme to get into that regime. So in particular, we use a very low modulus silicone rubber substrate, 50 kilopascal, about 30 microns in thickness. And then we use these silicon nanomembranes and thin metallization, uh, but structured into open spider web mesh layout. So this kind of serpentine uh, design and fully optimized by quantitative FEM analysis. So this is not an arbitrary, you know, curvy shape, but really one that's optimized from the mechanics. And if you do that, you can integrate this kind of spider web circuit with this kind of soft rubber sheet. And if you do stress strain analysis of that, you see it has a very linear elastic response to strains up to about 30% consistent with FEM analysis, but where the effective modulus of the integrated system is about 130 to 150 kilopascal. So the circuit is loading the mechanics of the underlying substrate, but not too bad. So you stay in a range that's very comparable to skin. This is pig skin. So it actually goes nonlinear at about 20%. So the skin starts ripping in this, in this regime. But in this linear regime, you're very, very well matched uh, to pig skin, which is pretty comparable to human skin. So that's the uh, design uh, strategy. And it turns out you take these membranes, you can cut them into any shapes you want, in particular these snaky sort of serpentine geometries. This is a small amplifier used to measure electrophysiological signals. I'll come back to this in a little bit, where we have a silicon serpentine shaped resistor and then a transistor, silicon transistor right there, source drain and gate electrodes. And the device doesn't care too much about the, the particular geometry, you get uh, good characteristics. And you can drop other kinds of semiconductor device technologies into this kind of platform. There's PN junction diode. You can use that as a photodiode or solar cell. You can embed strain gauges here so you can measure how the uh, skin is stretching and deforming into that kind of uh, uh, wavy uh, mesh layout with this uh, favorable mechanics. So this is what it looks like when it's on the skin. Uh, this is mounted up on the skin of the postdoc who's doing the work. And then we poked him with a glass rod to just show you how that uh, deforms and it uh, moves with the natural motions uh, of the skin, uh, which is what we wanted. If you peel this back, it has a very tissue-like uh, mechanics to it. And in this case, it's so thin and flexible and floppy, it just collapses on top of itself.
which brings up the question of how do you manipulate this stuff? How do you move it around and get it mounted up onto the skin? And the way that we do that is we put it onto a water-soluble temporary uh, plastic carrier substrate, in this case uh, PVA. So there's the serpentine circuit mounted on the PVA. You flip that over, you put it against the skin, you wash away the PVA, that just leaves the epidermal electronics integrated with the skin. Just the walls adhesion forces in this case, no separate adhesives or uh, penetrating uh, pins. So this is an idea that's really borrowed from the world of temporary transfer tattoos, not that creative, but it does work, and I have a movie that shows that. So this is a uh, demonstration platform of this kind of electronics. I'll come back to that in a second. What you're seeing is this sheet of uh, PVA uh, facing outward. Uh, next to that PVA sheet is this very thin low modulus silicone. The circuit is on top of that, and then the skin is on the other side of that. So the circuit is embedded and pressing directly against the skin. And what's happening here is that the postdoc is washing away the PVA uh, with a little bit of water applied with his finger. And as that PVA washes away, it just leaves the circuit well adhered to the uh, skin, and you'll see that. So this is a uh, very much a demonstration platform. It's not a full integrated system with a type of functionality, although all the individual devices are functional. So it consists of an array of NMOS uh, silicon transistors, silicon RF diodes, temperature sensors, strain gauges, inductors, capacitors, LC oscillators, inductive coil, and an RF antenna uh, around the outside. Uh, that's the antenna and some of the other components here. So this is the outer boundary of that ultra-thin silicone rubber sheet. That's the circuit, uh, and we're just pinching the skin to show that the circuit really uh, moves in a natural way that doesn't constrain at all the motion of the skin because the mechanical loading effects are negligible. So from a mechanical standpoint, it's invisible. It's like uh, a temporary transfer tattoo in that sense. But this is full integrated silicon uh, electronics with high performance capabilities. Uh, just, you know, using these simple ideas in mechanics. So you can deform it around like that. You get a sense of how that works. Uh, and then the movie will show it being peeled away. And again, the reason why it's adhering is because you've driven the stresses down. We have not induced and introduced a robust adhesive. As a result, you peel it from the side, you know, it comes off pretty easily. Uh, as you can see here, it's not pulling on the skin very much. Maybe right there is, is the only spot. You can see it come off. It eventually comes completely off of the skin. And there's something like really disgusting about this uh, piece of technology. <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, anyway, it's very skin-like. Just for fun, we can use a real temporary tattoo, which is actually kind of an interesting piece of materials technology. It's already well, well developed. It's FDA approved. There's a good adhesive. You just slap the circuit on the back side of that uh, and then laminate that. This is actually a custom tattoo. Illinois has nothing to do with pirates, but uh, my postdoc thought this was appropriate, like tattoos and pirates. So we put the U of I logo on his hat right there. So you, this is a little bit different. It's not a water-soluble backing. You just peel it back. So there is an adhesive here, so it's much more robustly attached to the skin. That might be a little bit more realistic than just this Van der Waals adhesion for real-world use. So you can do this. Uh, you know, this may be a practical way to do things. So the circuit is actually right there. So you can't see it. So if you're into spy games, this might be an interesting way to conceal your <laughs> electronics. <laughs> Maybe you have a skin-colored patch or something like that. Uh, you wouldn't notice that. Uh, but again, because the mechanics is what it is, when you squeeze this thing and move it around, you'll see that the facial region, which is where the circuit is, is deforming uh, qualitatively in exactly the same way as everything else uh, around uh, the tattoo. So it's not really having a noticeable mechanical effect on the tattoo, which is kind of what we wanted uh, to achieve in the first place. So you'll see this uh, deform around a little bit, give you a sense of that. So again, the circuit is right there, and it's not, it's not moving in any different kind of way. So let's see this move. One more second. Let me speed up this movie a little bit. So <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll skip through it. I mean, there's, it's scrape the tattoo back, and you can see the circuit, but hopefully you trust me that there's really a circuit back there. We only thought through the time. So if you think about the mechanics, we talked about that a lot. Now, what would you do with a uh, piece of electronics on your skin? Maybe you put your cell phone there. It's not that interesting. If you have something on your skin, it'd be best if you could exploit that interface and do some kind of communication with the biology. So in that case, you're interested not only in the mechanics of that interface, but the electrical properties. And so really, you, it demands intimate contact of the electrodes with the skin. So you do confocal imaging 
of a stained tattoo like that. So this is one intersection in that serpentine mesh. And then you can do cross sections uh, in that. So the pig skin is dyed blue here. And you see the device is pretty conformal to the uh, topology on the skin. You can see you, know, you have good contacts there. And as a result, you can measure electrophysiological behavior in the body with this kind of device. So you laminate it on the chest, you can measure ECG, you laminate it on your arm or your leg, and you contract your muscles, you can measure EMG, and you can also measure brain function. So this is the kind of QRS waveform you expect to see in a high quality ECG, measuring the heart. This is the device laminated on the leg, so you can walk around, you can see the electrical activity there. This is this uh, epidermal electronics, and just as a point of comparison, this is a conventional conductive gel-based paste-on electrode. And so we're not saying the uh, signal quality is any better. It's similar. It's interesting, though, because it doesn't involve the uh, cumbersome, you know, paste-on patch. And so it's just much more wearable. And it also allows you to mount on locations of the body that are just incompatible with a wire and a patch, as I'll describe in a second. So you can put these things on the forehead. You can measure uh, EEG. This is just measurement of alpha, alpha rhythms and a Stroop test. These sort of common tests that are used to measure cognition, and you can do that as well with these uh, devices. So, you know, epidermal patch on your head might be a nicer thing than a, than a wire-based patch. The other thing you can do, as I mentioned, you can put it on parts of the body where you don't want a wire and a sticky patch. So you can put these things on your neck. And the neck is interesting because there's a lot of fine muscle uh, activity going on in the neck when you speak. And so you put this thing on, on your neck, you can measure spectrogram of EMG associated with that muscle motion. So this is uh, power spectrum in this direction and time along this direction in milliseconds. And so you can say, you know, put, it, put this thing on your neck and you can either vocally or subvocally say different words like stop and go. And if you look at the pattern of electrical activity, you see there are differences here. And so if you work with the right electrical engineer who knows how to do pattern recognition, he can take that data and bin it into different uh, words to uh, establish a connection between what's going on in your neck and a vocabulary, limited vocabulary. But just to show that there's enough information content here, you can actually establish a human machine interface based on neck EMG. And that could be interesting for controlling a prosthetic or somebody has a disease of the trachea. You could uh, you know, use this potentially as a way to uh, convert motions in the neck to speech. Uh, and so we wanted to demonstrate something like that. It turns out that Todd Coleman's students and my students were more interested in playing video games. And so we did that. So this is a neck EMG based video game controller. It's software based, so it's not particularly fast. You can't do an action game, but you can do a strategy game. So this is just uh, EMG controlled motion of a cursor up, down, left, and right. You can play this kind of Sokoban game. It's just a primitive demonstration that this does have information content allow you to do something uh, useful. So let me just conclude with this last uh, slide, which is just giving you a hint of uh, you know, maybe where we'd like to go in the future. So these devices go on the body. You can measure electrical activity of the body. It turns out you can also stimulate. And you can do that in a feedback loop. So you can stimulate muscle contractions. You can measure the activity of the muscle. And that turns out to be interesting for physical rehabilitation. So we work with a professor in Johns Hopkins University to do that. So this is a movie that will show you a demonstration of that type. So this is epidermal electronics stimulating and measuring muscle activity in the hindquarters of a shaved rat. So this is a anesthetized rat, shave it off, laminate it on using the approaches I showed you before. There's a ribbon cable here that allows us to measure EMG and then stimulate the muscle and do that in a feedback uh, loop. And so you can control the uh, animal. You know, this is just uh, early data, so this is a little bit primitive. But the key thing is that the device stays on the animal as it moves. So you have a good electrical uh, interface. I hope this doesn't give anybody nightmares tonight. <laughs> this, is a little, this gets a little strange, but anyway. So you can see this device is moving with the, uh, with the animal. And this may look like a crude type of motion. In some ways it is, but it's actually a little bit more subtle. You actually see a rotation and a small deflection right there and then a large scale reflection there. And that's being programmed uh, with this device. So you can do a little bit of control that way. But the idea is you put this on uh, the arm or leg of a patient who's suffering from an atrophied muscle or to accelerate wound healing, you might be able to do some, uh, some useful things uh, along those lines. So with that, let me uh, just conclude. I'm already a little bit over. But just highlight, uh, you know, this is pretty interdisciplinary stuff. We work with a lot of very uh, uh, outstanding senior collaborators. I mentioned the mechanician a few times. Manufacturing engineers, we work with them on these printers. Todd Coleman on the uh, 
uh, on the EEG stuff, Dae Young Kim's former student now at SNU. And then a lot of clinicians. You know, I didn't talk about the cardiology. We do a lot there. Neurology, rehabilitation I mentioned. Uh, and, you know, we think it's important to stay connected to the people who would potentially be using these things. And so how about clinical relevance? So I want to thank, thank all of those guys. This is an example of one of the cardiologists that we work with who's turned out to be a pretty interesting guy right there. And so these are a bunch of collaborators, another uh, form of collaborator at the bottom <laughs> some ways. So let me conclude then by uh, acknowledging all the students and postdocs. I'm very fortunate over the years to have really outstanding kids in the group and they do all the work. I just talk about it. So I want to acknowledge them and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, right. So the question has to do with power uh, on these devices. So a couple of answers on that. For the surgical tools, wires are fine uh, because you're in an environment that can accommodate those wires. For the uh, devices that are on the body, right now we're just using wired connections, uh, both for uh, power and communication, data input and output. Uh, we'd like to get th move those wires out of the picture, make them go away. So that means we have to have an answer on power and also on communication. On power, even in the first paper, we demonstrated that you can do uh, wireless coupling. You can either do uh, near field inductive RF coupling or far field RF powering. So you basically have a coil on your device, you shine RF on it, and you can throw a lot of power that way. I can throw you know, half a watt from me to you just with a relatively compact RF energy source. So I think in the short term, that's a good answer on power. The constraint is that you need to be in the beam path in order for your device to be working. So uh, I think ultimately you'd like to combine that kind of powering setup with a storage capability on the patch. And that's something that we're working on. Uh, the other thing is I had mentioned that you can do these uh, silicon PN junction diodes. That's a solar cell. So depending on your power requirements, you can harvest light uh, energy uh, and you can use that. That's not going to light up an LED, for example. It's just not enough. But if you have an ultra low power radio, you know, microwatt level, you might be able to do it. You'd have to kind of go through the analysis. So we've demonstrated those two things. We think we need batteries. Uh, and then we have internal projects on mechanical energy harvesting, mostly in the context of the heart because it's always moving. So you can harvest a decent amount of power that way. So that's power. That's a good question. Uh, but if you really want the wires to go away, you need uh, data comm uh, solution as well. So we have RF devices already, uh, inductors, capacitors, diodes, and transistors. So we think we have the building blocks, and we're working on an active radio that can be integrated in this form. We don't have it yet, but I mean, that's, that's ongoing work. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, 3D. So how do you get this stuff really embedded in the tissue, not just sitting on the surface? So we focused on surface is a little bit less invasive. So we have devices that go all the way around the heart, these things on the brain, the skin. Uh, as you point out, and it actually has relevance to the Utah arrays uh, because those do penetrate. So it's not only solving the geometry mismatch, but it's actually providing functional access to buried uh, uh, neurons, essentially. So we're going in that direction. I think there are some uh, ideas in bioresorbable materials that you can exploit. So penetrating pins that deliver LEDs down into the depth of the brain. That's some work that we're doing with folks at Washington University. So the pins themselves are bioresorbable, or there's a bioresorbable uh, adhesive, so you can pull the pins out. Because the actual device is very, very thin. It's not taking up much space. It's smaller than a cell in, in most cases. So our hope is that if you do that, then you could really embed directly into the depth of the tissue electronics uh, in a way that goes beyond anything I've described uh, so far. But that's, that's ongoing work, and it's just more challenging. We try to go off after the low-hanging stuff first, but that's a very good question. It's where we'd like to go, and, and we're working in that direction. Yeah.
So that's a very interesting question, smaller, better, and what is the Moore's Law equivalent for us? I mean, I think for us mechanics is the, the Moore's Law scaling trend, right? So if you think about the interface mechanics in the skin, it's not a matter of matching the properties of the epidermis. Lower in modulus is always better for everything, right? So how low can you go, right, is, is kind of an interesting uh, th way to think about it. Because uh, these devices, you know, the value is not driven by gigahertz processors and things like that. Body's not operating that quickly anyway, right? So it's a different type of scaling metric. It's different than, than Moore's Law. But the, but the interesting thing is that it's oddly coincident with Moore's Law developments because in the mechanics, smaller is always better, narrower, smaller lateral dimensions, and thinner. And that's the way that Moore's Law is going. So you're going to SOI substrates with thinner and thinner device silicon. You're shrinking the dimensions down. The transistors are getting smaller and smaller. So my thought is that's a great synergy because they're trying to make devices faster, but the way they're making them faster also helps on the mechanics. So uh, you know our vision is you use a silicon foundry and you pick off devices rather than just pieces of silicon and you integrate those into these spider web mesh layouts with all the buckling mechanics and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm optimistic that there is that overlap in, in, in technologies in a little bit unexpected way. Any other questions? One last question. Yeah. Um, so I'd make a couple of comments on that. I think what we're trying to hear, do here, the value is driven by function. We're not trying to undercut the cost of some existing things. So we're trying to enable capabilities that don't exist in any form. And they're addressing important problems in human health where cost is important, but it's sometimes not the overriding consideration. You have somebody's dying, right? You want to bring the best technology to bear that problem as you possibly can. So uh, I think cost is important consideration, but it is not the dominating one for these types of systems. Now having said that, the way that you can think about what we're doing, it's building on top of a, a base of uh, commercial manufacturing that's already there. So the wafer processing, the purification techniques, a lot of the lithographic procedures, the growth chambers, the undercut etching, the lithography, that already exists. And so our thought is you have an existing foundry capability, you just modify that a, a little bit, right? And then add at the back end uniqueness in the packaging of those devices, putting them in the wavy geometry, getting them on the uh, low modulus substrate. So our hope is because you're building on something that already exists rather than reinventing it, that the cost will be comparable to or incremental over what's existing already in consumer electronics. So it's not going to explode the cost and maybe add a little bit, but you buy yourself a lot of function uh, by doing that. So at the same time, I'm an academic. You know, I haven't scoped the costs. You know? So I think it is an important question, one worth thinking about. Uh, but you know, we're kind of in exploratory mode. And uh, I think it's reasonable to think that, it, that, that you could accommodate the cost. But you know, that's, that's about it. I had one last question. How many of these uh, devices did your students stick on you? <laughs> I usually go to talks with these devices on my skin. The problem, the reason why I didn't do it this time is there's a string of talks that I did that, and it requires by hand fabrication. So I figured I'd give them a break on this one. Do you get any trouble going through security? No, no, it's just a tiny, <laughs> tiny amount of metal. It's never been a problem. But it is an interesting form of body art, if nothing else. So I think okay, this is great. a good thing. We know yeah. you travel very light, yeah. so we thought you might have a little bit of room in your suit. <laughs> okay, great. This, this is Richard, a uh, brittle uh, glass. We need, yes, you know, uh, this is, this is a problem. We're on a flexible vest, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, you're the master. Uh, okay. so. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh,